So thank you, Paula, for the introduction. And I'd like to thank Development again for having me here. So today I'll present to you some of the main findings of my PhD in David Price's group at the University of Edinburgh, which is about the transcription factor PEC6 and its functions in regulating the morphological and electrophysiological development of mouse prethalamic neurons. So our lab studies the transcription factor PEC6, which is, which is a well-known high-level master regulator gene that plays multiple crucial functions during early neural development. So here is a whole mount in situ staining of PEC6 in a mouse embryo at the embryonic day nine and a half when neurogenesis had just started. And you can see how widely and strongly PEC6 is expressed in the forebrain. So just like many of these high-level transcription factors, the expression of PEC6 is mostly found in neuroprogenitor cells, which then shut down PEC6 expression upon exit of the cell cycle during neurogenesis. However, exceptions such as the postmitotic cells in the prethalamus, these neurons retain PEC6 expression as they mature. So one of the main questions that I had when I started my PhD was whether PEC6 can also influence the later development of the functional properties of the neurons that retain its expression. So to answer this question, I studied the embryonic development of the prethalamus. So where and what is the prethalamus? Here we have a schematic representation of a mouse neural tube at around the age of E12, E13, and you can see that the prethalamus is here. It resides in the rostral ventral part of the diencephalon, and the telencephalon is here. So if you look back at this e nine and a half image, you can see that the diencephalon is shown by the bracket here, and the telencephalon is here. If you take the neural tube, you cut it at this level and you turn it towards you, you have this coronal session um, and then you can see that the prethalamus is here, neighboring the thalamus and the cortex is here. So unlike the thalamus, which sends out long projecting axons to innervate the cortex, the prethalamus only sends out short distance axons to innervate the thalamus. And in the adult brain, the prethalamus the prethalamus-derived nuclei functions to fine-tune the activity of the thalamic nuclei via these connections. So if we do a double staining for PEC6 and TUJ1, which is a marker for postmitotic cells, and here is a coronal session of a mouse embryo at E13 and a half, and you can see that in the ventricular zone, where the proliferating cells are, PEC6 is expressed in the prethalamus, the thalamus, and also the cortex. However, only in the prethalamus, you can see this overlapping expression of PEC6 and TUJ1, confirming the expression of PEC6 in the postmitotic cells of the prethalamus. So in, two, in 2018, we published a study in which we utilized a mouse model that allows us to induce acute deletion of PEC6 in every single cell of the mouse embryo at any time point we want. And from there, we generated an RNA-seq data set, which shows the significantly differentially expressed genes in the control and the PEC6 conditional knockout mouse anterior cortex, prethalamus, and thalamus. So when we look further into this data set, we found a lot of the geoterms that are highly upregulated in the prethalamus are actually connected to quite specific postmitotic events, such as neuronal morphogenesis and ion transport. And when we look into the specific genes in these geoterms, we found a lot of cytoskeletal effector genes that have been shown to function during neuron neuronal morphogenesis, and we also found a lot of the genes involved in the axon initial segment formation, and also a lot of the genes that encode specific subunits of various voltage-gated ion channels. And so from there, we hypothesized that PEC6 can affect the development of neuronal morphology, the formation of the axon initial segment, and also the activity of these prethalamic neurons. To test these hypotheses, we utilize the same mouse model as in the RNA-seq study, and uh, we induced acute PEC6 deletion at E9.5 when neurogenesis just started, and we harvested these embryos at E13.5 
we dissected out the prethalamus from the control and the PEC6 conditional knockout embryos, and we performed dissociated cell culture of the embryonic prethalamus. So this in vitro system then allows us to follow closely the progression of neuronal morphogenesis, axon initial segment formation, and also we can do whole cell patching to recall the activity of these neurons. And for this talk, I will focus on axon initial segment formation and neuronal activity only. So the axon initial segment is a, uh, it's a specialized structure that's, local, that's located at the proximal end of an axon. It has these specialized cytos cytoskeletal proteins such as anchoring G here, which functions to tether high densities of voltage-gated sodium channels and voltage-gated potassium channels. Therefore, the axon initial segment is usually where action potentials are initiated in the mature neurons. So if you do a staining for anchoring G and voltage-gated sodium channels, you'll see this signature localized expression of anchoring G or voltage-gated sodium channels at the proximal end of an axon, marking where the uh, axon initial segment is. So to quantify the length and the location of the axon initial segment, we generated these intensity plots for each neuron we measured. And we trace down the axon and we measure the intensity of anchoring G and voltage-gated sodium channels. And we plotted that against the distance from the soma. And we set the start and the end location of the axon initial segment to be where the peak intensity of either anchoring G or voltage-gated sodium channels falls back to 33% of itself. So from here, so here is a schematic representation of the results of the statistic here. So what we found was that in the PEC6 conditional knockout prethalamic neurons cultured for seven days, the cytoskeletal backbone of the axon initial segment, anchoring G, started more started significantly more distally from the soma, whereas its length didn't change. In terms of the voltage-gated sodium channels, the start location didn't change, but then the length became significantly longer. So if you recall, the anchoring G is the cytoskeletal backbone that tethers the voltage-gated sodium channels at the axon initial segment. So the fact that the expression of the voltage-gated sodium channels now exceeds the limit of the of anchoring G actually might indicate there might be some malfunctioning of axon initial segment formation in these PEC6 conditional knockout prethalamic neurons at this stage. So at day nine, the start location of the anchoring G didn't change, but then the length had become significantly longer, whereas the start location of the voltage-gated sodium channel had became significantly more distal while the length didn't change. So from here, we concluded that losing PEC6 can alter the length and the location of the axon initial segments in the prethalamic neurons, making them to locate more distally and become longer. So next, we want to find out some of the electrophysiological properties of these prethalamic neurons. So here are some representative uh, electrical traces from these prethalamic neurons cultured for seven and nine days when they were given certain amount of current stimuli. And you can already see that there seems to be some difference between the control and the conditional knockouts. So we try to quantify some of these aspects. And firstly, we looked at uh, the minimum current needed to initiate an action potential. This is also known as real base. So the conditional knockout data is shown at, in different shades of red here, and the control data are shown in different um, shades of gray here. So as you can see on both days of the cell culture, the PEC6 conditional knockouts need um, less amount of current or lower real basis to initiate an action potential. This difference is not yet significant at day seven, but it had become significant at day nine. So from here, we concluded that losing PEC6 seems to make these prethalamic neurons more excitable. And next, we, con we compared the waveforms of reaction potentials fired by these prethalamic neurons when real bases are reached. So as you can see here at day seven, the PEC6 conditional knockouts um, for the, the waveforms of the action potentials that they fire became significantly shorter and wider. 
So some of these uh, phenotypes are actually recovered at day nine, that the height of the action potential uh, became no difference, but then the width is still significantly wider. So from here, we concluded that losing PEC6 can also affect the waveforms of the action potentials fired by these prethalamic neurons. And lastly, we want to know if we keep increasing the amplitude of the current stimuli that we give to these prethalamic neurons, would they be able to fire multiple action potentials? Or in other words, will they be, fire action, will they be able to fire action potentials repetitively? So as you can see here, if we increase the amplitude of the current stimuli, um, the PEC6 conditional knockouts cannot fire as many action potentials as their control counterpart. But this phenotype is on, it's also recovered at day nine. So from here, we concluded that losing PEC6 can also affect, can also reduce repetitive firing in the prethalamic neurons, but this is only at an earlier time point. So to summarize what we found, we looked at um, the neuron, the, the development of functional properties and activities of the prethalamic neurons, which is unusual as they retain PEC6 expression as they mature. And when losing PEC6, um, they displayed disrupted neurite extension, which I didn't have the time to cover in this talk. And we also found that their axon initial segment located significantly more distal from the soma and it had also became longer and we also found that these neurons displayed altered electrophysiological properties that they became more excitable that their action potential waveforms are changed and also um, they cannot fire as repeatedly at some time point so to our knowledge this is the first piece of evidence of detailed detailing that PEC6 can affect the later development of functional properties and also activities of the neurons. So what might this have, what impact might this have in terms of the, the activity of the entire nervous system? So we know that in human patients with congenital aniridia, which is a condition with absence of the iris, Due to, the, uh, due to deficiency in PEC6 expression, there has been increasing evidence suggesting the association with, of congenital aniridia with cognitive problems such as um, attention deficit and autistic-like behavior. So with our finding, we speculate that changes in the functional properties and also activities in these PEC6 retaining neurons in losing PEC6 in the loss of PEC6 might also contribute to some of these phenotypes that we see in human patients. So with all these, I'd like to thank my supervisors who are also in the audience today, um, Dave, Idoya, and Tom for always being there for me and guiding me to grow into an independent researcher. I'd like to thank Adam and Javi for helping me setting up the wholesale patching experiment. I'd like to thank Michael and Sam for pro uh, proofreading our manuscript. And I'd also like to thank everyone from Debug for being amazing companies to me throughout this wonderful journey. And thank you so much for your attention and I welcome any questions and discussions. Thank you. Tian Tian, that was a wonderful seminar. So well delivered. Thank you so much. Yeah, Thank very, you. very nice. You already have um, a question from uh, Alex. Mm -hmm. um, so it says, thank you for the talk. Mm -hmm. In a condition where the VGSC domain extends beyond the ANC-G, do you think a VGSC is anchored by another protein or is some sort of anchor independent localization? Oh, that's a really good question. I actually haven't thought of that. Um, I think from the literature, um, well, I'm not very sure what's really happening uh, there. And my interpretation might be that uh, what we're seeing is a transi transition stage during the formation of the exon initial segment. It might be that in the PEC6 mutant, you have this upregulated expression of voltage-gated sodium channels, and they might be over-expressing, over-producing, and then there also might be some sort of um, assortment issues going on there. And then maybe that's why we're seeing that the voltage-gated sodium channels are actually not correlating with where the anchoring G is. So yeah, that would be my um, 
And also, I think uh, with the exon initial segment, we haven't really completely figured out what are the molecular composition of it yet. So there is the possibility that there might be other cytoskeletal proteins able to tether the voltage-gated sodium channels there that might be um, maybe overexpressed in PEC6 and taking over the job. I think these are, it might also be possible. Um, can more from, I actually have one as well, from James Briscoe, who says uh -huh. there are many isoforms of PAC6. Uh -huh. Do you know if the activity that you detect and describe is dependent on a specific isoform? Um, so, that I'm not sure. So, I did look into the specific isoforms in the different types of mouse models that we had in the lab, but um, I'm not really sure if this is specific to like um, a specific type of, um, this is caused by a specific isoform of PEC6. And also, um, I'm not sure if I can check how that might be possible because with we do have a small eye mutant in the lab, which, um, which actually causes um, the, deletion, the deletion of another domain of PEC6 than the mouse model that we're using currently. But that is um, that is deleting. But then with the small eye mutant, you delete PEC6 from the very beginning of embryogenesis, and you actually don't have a prethalamus in those embryos. So I'm not sure if um, how to check um, if, if they are caused by specific isoforms, how to check that in terms of, for example, mouse model-wise. All right, you keep on getting great questions here. Yeah. This one is from Carol Kaiser, mm -hmm. um, and she, she's asking, uh, PAC6 uh, is also expressed in the cortical hem, a region that gives rise to the choroid plexus. Mm -hmm. In your model of acute deletion, uh, have you looked at the lateral ventricle uh, choroid plexus? I did notice that uh, in my staining, but unfortunately, I didn't look at choroid plexus. I was quite turn tunnel visioned. I was focused only on the prethalamus. Um, all right, then I have a question from Gabriel de Silva Pescador, uh, who says, great talk. I completely agree. You gave a fantastic talk. So. Uh, do you believe the changes you see in PAC6 knockout neurons uh, are related to these neurons changing to a different type of neuron? Well, thank you so much for this question. Um, I was really interested in looking at this, uh, actually. So if you, if I am to allow to elaborate on this, I think um, the effect that we are seeing is actually a mixed effect of multiple um, events that happened when you delete PEC6. So we know that um, from the 2018 study that we published, so if you delete PEC6, you, you, you sort of change the timing of differentiation and pro proliferation in the diencephalon and also in the cortex. And also um, in my thesis, and also in that uh, 2018 paper, we had shown that PEC6 is needed to protect um, the prethalamus from overwhelming or strong expression of wind. So there is the possibility that uh, we're not just seeing a difference, a difference in um, proliferation slash differentiation. We might be also seeing a patterning defect. And we, um, so it is, it is possible that um, these neurons, when they lose PEC6, they're not 100%, if you can say it, prethalamic neurons anymore. So that's, and, and, and also, um, we did found a putative binding site in the promoter of uh, anchoring G. Uh, so a putative binding site of PEC6 in the promoter of anchoring G. So that indicates that um, apart from the patterning or um, effects that you might be thinking here, PEC6 might be still able to bind to these um, quite downstream like cytoskeletal proteins itself to control its expression.